Hello everybody and welcome to this morning's broadcast sponsored by Still Pond and Betterton Methodist Churches. This is Pastor Bill thanking you for tuning in and we're most grateful for your kind gifts to the ministries of these two churches. So please continue your gifts either by mailing them or using the secure online option that's available on our website, stillbetterchurch.org. We'd love to have you join us for Sunday worship in our sanctuaries. Betterton Church begins our service at 9 a.m., Still Pond service begins at 10.30 a.m., so come as you are. And if you can't make it, you'll always find a video of our, our Sunday morning broadcast posted on our website. Betterton Church will be celebrating its rededication of their church building next Sunday, November 5th at 2 p.m. Everyone's invited to come and inspect our ongoing renovations to the building. And special music will be provided by the Great Awakening Band. And Sisters by Chance will be catering the event. We'll have some special guests and some surprises for everyone. So mark your calendars and come and join in this special celebration. We also invite you to join us for our weekly Bible study uh, based upon Season 3 of the television series, The Chosen. We meet every Thursday evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Betterton Volunteer Fire Company. And the class is filling up, but we still have plenty of room for a few more. So come and discover what it means to be chosen by God. Let us begin today's worship service with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, so many years have passed since Jesus was crucified. Those scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting one another, we've mingled your truth with fantasies developed within the human mind. Lord, some of the holidays we celebrate originated from the life, the death, and the resurrection of your son Jesus, but We've exchanged the true meanings behind his story into unholy celebrations. Forgive us, we pray. Guide us into the true story of Christ crucified, that we might live a righteous life, one that resembles his life given for us. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today I invite you to open your uh, Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Today we're going to read from verses 45 to 56. Again, it's Matthew 27, 47. 45 to 56. I know it's the weekend before Halloween and we're nowhere near Easter Sunday, but today's story of Jesus' crucifixion reveals a passage that doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. So let us hear what many people think is a true-to-life ghost story as we begin reading at verse 45 where Matthew says, From noon until three in the afternoon darkness came over all the land. And that by three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff, and he offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. And they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified, and they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs, and among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the lyrics of Katharina von Schlegel, let us pray. 
Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Lead to your God to order and provide. In every change, God faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Amen. We sometimes forget the human side of Christ. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, was a man who suffered miserably on the cross, taking the debt of our sins upon himself. And he died to save us. And verse 50 of today's text says that he cried out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Now, this giving up the spirit translates from the Greek meaning that Jesus gave up his last breath. Christ did not die from the nails driven into his hands and feet, nor did he die from the soldier's spear being thrust into his side. Crucifixion is a form of suffocation. When Jesus could no longer push his body up on that cross to get a breath of air, he exhaled one last time. He gave the breath of God that had been given to him back to his Heavenly Father. And then from a human standpoint, all hell seems to break loose. You know, the curtain in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, almost as if God himself reached down to rip the cloth that separated the world from the holy place where the Lord exists here on earth. You know, with Christ crucified, we can now enter into a holy relationship with God and we become the temple of his existence here on earth. But following that, there's an earthquake so high on the Richter scale that rock splits and tombs are broke wide open. Earthquakes are not uncommon for this region, and the greatest aftershock may have happened just three days later. Matthew 28, 2 reads, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat upon it. Now, this is the day we remember that Mary Magdalene and her friends came to apply the spices upon Jesus' body to complete his hasty burial. The Roman guards who were ordered to watch the tomb so no one would disturb it were so frightened. They shook and became like dead men. They took on the appearance of zombies. It's a good thing the angel was there to give the women the good news that Christ was risen from the dead. Otherwise, they might have freaked out from the earthquake and the statuesque soldiers and the sudden appearance of someone dressed in bright white sitting atop the stone. Now, if all of this isn't weird enough for you, <laughs> bodies of the holy people who had already died in Christ were raised to life and found walking in Jerusalem, appearing to many others. Many believe the risen dead spoken of here begin, began their walk in the city right after Christ died. But we need to examine verse 53 a little bit closer because it says they came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection. Now, if the tombs are broke open when Jesus dies on the cross, do the risen dead sit in their tombs for three days and three nights waiting for Jesus to rise before they start wandering the streets? Or is the earthquake mentioned in today's passage the same one that happens when Christ is risen from the dead? Oh, and by the way, who are the dead in Christ? Who are the saints that had died before Jesus is crucified? Now, the Protestant churches believe that all people who come to Christ are saints, whether they're dead or alive. This means that if you have repented of your sins and believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are a saint. When the Apostle Paul opens his letter to the Roman church, he says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from, the God, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he does the same in his letter to the Corinthians. He opens by saying, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul's letters were written to people who are alive in Christ. They're written to the saints, folks who have been set apart from others just by believing that Jesus died for their sins, saving them from eternal damnation. So again, I ask, who are the saints who are initially raised from their tombs to walk the streets of Jerusalem after Christ's resurrection? Well, we need to look at some of the folks that came to Jesus when he, when he was just a child. 
Remember that the shepherds came to see Christ's child when he was born in the manger in Bethlehem. And scripture says that after they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what the angels had told them about the newborn king of the Jews. And when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple for, for his bris, his uh, circumcision, they run into two people. Simeon, who was very old, was promised by the Lord that he would not die before seeing the Messiah. And Simeon held the Christ child saying, Lord, now I can die, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And then there was Anna, a widow who never left the temple, but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. And when she saw the child, she knew he was the promised Messiah, as she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of, this, of Jerusalem. You see, these folks were probably long gone when Jesus began his ministry. Chances are they, and many more, knew him to be the Messiah, even before his death and resurrection. And rather than keeping the news to themselves, they spread the word about Christ. And that's what saints do. They believe in Jesus, and they display their faith through service and preaching the gospel. There's a lot of mystery surrounding the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I know that it's sometimes hard to believe the story. <coughs> Pardon me. And part of what we have read today lays the groundwork for ghost stories and odd traditions established by the church leaders over the years to come. You know, some folks might even say that today's passage creates the basic framework surrounding what we know today as Halloween. But actually, the roots for celebrating Halloween are found in a 2,000-year-old Celtic festival known as Samhain. <clears throat> The Celts, who lived in Ireland and England and northern France, they believed the new year began on November 1st. The word Samhain actually means summer's end, <coughs> Pardon me. meaning that the growing season and harvest was complete and it's time to get ready for winter. Now, the Celts were very superstitious. According to History.com, they believed that the boundary between the living and the dead was blurred on the night before their new year which happened to be October 31st. And on that night, the ghosts of the dead would return to earth and cause mischief to the living. Oftentimes, they were thought to have damaged their crops. So as a deterrent, the Celts would dress up in animal skins and costumes to confuse the ghosts. The Druid priests would try to interpret the impending winter weather, and folks would dance around bonfires, sacrificing animals and crops just to appease the Celtic deities in hopes they would give them a mild winter. Now, the Roman Empire, they conquered the Celts in 43 AD, and over the next 400 years, Two of their festivals were combined with Samhain. One was the celebration commemorating the dead who had passed during the previous year. And the second festival honored Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruit and trees. And the symbol for Pomona was an apple, which is probably why we bob for apples as one of our Halloween customs today. <coughs> Christianity eventually made its way north into the Celtic lands. And the Roman Catholic Church moved their All Martyrs Day celebration from May 13th to November 1st, and then called it All Saints Day to celebrate the patron saints as well as the martyred souls who had died bringing the gospel to foreign nations. The thinking behind this move was to replace the Samhain tradition. But when the Catholic Church launched all, the All Souls Day on November 2nd, they opened up the celebration to bonfires and parades and costumes, much like the Sal Wind Festival. And in fact, the costumes not only included saints and angels, they also included demons and the devil. The November 1st celebration, All Saints Day, was early titled All Hallows Mass. And the night before October 31st was called All Hallows Eve, and eventually shortened to Halloween. And when North America became colonized, the European church traditions came across the Atlantic Ocean with the pilgrims. And the customs were mingled with the American Indian culture. Parties were held to celebrate the harvest, complete with dancing and singing, telling of fortunes, sharing stories of the dead, telling ghost stories, 
and mischief, may, mischief making as well. <coughs> When the great uh, potato, pardon me, when the great potato famine hit Ireland in the late 1800s, immigrants from Europe flooded the United States, bringing the Halloween customs with them and popularizing the celebration nationwide. Today, over six b six billion with a b dollars are spent annually for this secular holiday, and virtually no one dresses up as a saint or martyr anymore. Now. We celebrate the religion of fantasy. From superheroes to Barbie to witches to vampires to zombies and to ghosts. For the most part, all Christian overtones have been lost in the Halloween celebration. I guess you just can't mingle human idealism with church observances without eventually losing the real reason behind the season. You know, the Jewish faith depends upon the Mosaic laws found in the Torah, or what we know as the first five books of the Bible. And the laws were handed down to Moses from God to promote holiness among the Israelites. And holiness meant wholeness, not mingling their faith with other religions and their observances. And as an illustration for this ideal of wholeness, the Israelites were given rules for everyday living that restricted mixing things up. For instance, in Leviticus chapter 19, the Lord explains to his chosen people to keep my decrees. Do not crossbreed different kinds of animals. Do not plant your fields with two different seeds. And do not wear clothing woven of two different kinds of material. Seems a little hard-nosed to restrict the Jews to these terms, but the, the message from God is that his chosen people were to be consecrated. They were set apart from other nations and their lifestyles and their observances. He wanted, <coughs> he wanted their worship to be a fabric of one cloth, of one God. Their personal holiness depended upon their conviction to the Lord. And yet, the Old Testament is full of stories where the Israelites mingled their love for God with love for idols from other cultures. <clears throat> as contemporary Christians, we're just as guilty when it comes to compromising our faith for secular lifestyles. We spend more time and money dressing up for Halloween and handing out candy than we do helping the needy. And the world has more interest in horror movies than those that portray wholesome Christian actions of love and grace and, and compassion. For instance, the 1973 horror movie, The Exorcist, pulled in a phenomenal $193 million when it was first released. And since then, it has reaped over $441 million in television and theater reruns. Now, during that same year, Jesus Christ Superstar earned only $24.5 million at the box office. I guess the world is drawn more to the horrors of this life than to the promise of life everlasting through Christ Jesus. Now, <coughs> pardon me. Now, I'm not saying we should stop going to movies that interest us. And I'm not saying we should partic shouldn't participate in family-oriented celebrations that promote a sense of joy and happiness. My point is that as Christians, we need to hold to the truth that is the Bible. We are called to a personal holiness that separates us from the unbelieving world. We shouldn't mingle our faith with worldly rituals and beliefs. We need to hold fast to the presence of God made real in Christ Jesus. And we should allow the Holy Spirit to guide us away from the choice of sin. <coughs> I know, I know, some religions call the Spirit the Holy Ghost. And that's okay. Just so we don't think he's only a ghost story. After all, the Spirit is the breath of God that is eternal life for all his saints. So don't say boo. Just say yes to Jesus and do so today. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we walk this earth carrying your Holy Spirit within us. Help us to not stray from the path of wholeness and righteousness. This world is rife with evil and we thank you for sparing our souls from the fate of hell. But guide us to be witnesses of Christ to those around us. <coughs> so they might see your grace in us. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. At today's closing thought, the term trick-or-treat is by grammatical context considered a threat. It means that someone will perform some mischief against you, or they have already planned to, but they will change their mind when you give them a bribe instead, a treat. You know, as a kid, I remember trick-or-treating with a friend of mine walking through the neighbor through his neighborhood. And on our way back to his house, we encountered a couple of older boys who weren't even dressed in costume. They were up to no good and threatened homeowners who wouldn't give them any candy by throwing eggs at their houses. Now, how do I know this? Well, I was a victim of their, their mischief. I was egged too. The devil was full of mischief and deceit. He tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden by pointing out how delicious the forbidden fruit looked. She couldn't resist the treat, and neither could Adam. Their violation of God's commandment brought the sickness of sin upon all mankind. No one can escape this malady, at least not on their own. You see, the risen Christ removes our guilt, our willingness to sin, our thoughts of mischief and misbehaving. And it is the Holy Ghost that keeps us from throwing eggs at other people. He doesn't threaten us. He encourages us to do what is right in the sight of God. Friends, don't give in to the devil. Don't mingle your faith with worldly ideas. Find a church that preaches the gospel truth and won't give in to unholy rituals and superstitions. And then go to that church regularly. What better way is there to fight Satan than to give yourself entirely unto Jesus Christ? You see, his resurrection is no ghost story. He is alive and well, and he's ready to lead you into his salvation. I make you this solemn promise. This is no trick, but you must be willing to walk into God's neighborhood to receive the treat that is eternal life. Remember to set your clock back one hour next week as we return to Eastern Standard Time and join us for worship in our sanctuaries. But if you're unable to do so, you can always tune in next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for another broadcast. And until then, go in peace. And may the peace of God go with you. Amen.